Welcome to the Wright Family Law Divorce Podcast with your host, Ellen Wright, family law attorney, divorce coach, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker, discussing all things divorce and helping you learn to keep the pain of separation from holding you back. And now, your host, Ellen Wright. Welcome to episode 11 of the Wright Family Law Divorce Podcast. I'm Ellen Wright host of Right Family Law Divorce Podcast. And today I have with me Amanda Greaves. Amanda is an entrepreneur who's owned and operated her interior design business for the past 13 years and is a personal leadership and business culture coach. She's in the process of writing her first book, The Chameleon Diaries. Amanda has worked with over 300 clients in the opportunities of learning what they truly want and providing the tools and the training to obtain their goals. She's been featured in various publications regarding her design work and thought leadership motions. Her design firm, AG & Co., has been awarded a dozen awards for excellence in design and teamwork. Amanda is a member of Tony Robbins Master University, North Shore Chamber of Commerce, Toastmasters Club, and Empower Yoga Studio. She's earned a bachelor's in arts from Marymount University with a major in interior design and a minor in psychology. As a survivor of emotionally abusive relationships, multiple emotionally abusive yeah. relationships, she's become an expert in relationship observations and pattern assessments. She's familiar with the effects of narcissism and manipulation on partners of people struggling with bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. She's quickly becoming a sought after speaker on various podcasts and interviews and is aspiring to be a world-renowned motivational speaker, hopefully sharing the stage with the likes of Brendan Bouchard, Danielle Laporte, and Gabrielle Bernstein someday. Amanda, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us today. You have such a remarkable business background, your management, your coaching, all of it. It's just spectacular. But I think what is truly remarkable is all you've accomplished despite these toxic relationships and the marriages that you were involved in. I mean, you've really come straight through it. And, you know, the whole journey leading you to write this book in process, The Chameleon Diaries, it's just, it's such an amazing goal. And what you're doing is just, is really remarkable. So why don't you start out by giving us an overview of the book, The Chameleon Diaries, and what inspired you to write it? So... To get right into it, the inspiration behind the book is all of the multiple stories from my most recent relationship, which was, at the end of the day, the most abusive one overall. And when I say that, there was manipulation and narcissism included. But the book itself is about pattern recognition, understanding why you repeat the same thing over and over again, and how to learn how to get out of toxic relationships. It's such a, a conundrum for people, you know, because so often people's identities are hung up in the relationship. Like they let the relationship define who they are. I had someone actually write a post on, I did a Facebook reel this past week on someone who put a question on my page, which was, how do I find myself again? How do I overcome self-doubt and learn to love myself after the divorce? And it's such a weighty question. It's like such a minefield of a question. How do you define self-doubts and insecurities in the context of divorce? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that happens, I was married twice and mm -hmm. I got divorced twice. And when were you married? Oh gosh, when I was a baby around <laughs> the age of 22. And then I tried it again when I was 30. But in between those two, and then even after that, I didn't realize how much self-doubt I still had in myself. I really looked towards the people that I was getting into relationships with to mm. fulfill me. And unfortunately, that was not the best route to take. So the self-doubt and my insecurities, I kept pushing them aside. And I kept looking to others to fix what was going on inside of me without really learning how to love myself more. Defining self-doubt and insecurities, they unfortunately, they start when we're very young. And if we don't, as our parents would say, nip them in the bud when they're early, they will just morph and continue to grow. What are some common challenges individuals face when they're dealing with self-doubt and insecurities after divorce and trauma? Common challenges, well, 
you've already touched on it. It's getting lost and not knowing who you actually are, especially if you are the type of person, which a lot of us seem to be, where you put everything that you are into the relationship in the hopes to fulfill their dreams and work with them on what it is that they want, supporting them, encouraging them. And if it's not coming back equally, you can very easily get lost in their goals and in their dreams, especially if, again, if you have children, mm -hmm. you get lost in the lives of your children and you forget to take care of yourself. You forget to make yourself a priority every once in a while. And then eventually you just feel so empty that you just look for anything around you to help fill those voids. It's hard. So many people struggle with this. It's almost an epidemic. The, yeah, they're the new normal, really. It, you know, it is becoming I mean, quickly. Emotional bankruptcy, looking for that hope, that strength, that security in a partner, you know? Could you share a personal experience from your own journey or from someone you've worked with where overcoming the self-doubt made a significant impact? So when I was getting my second divorce, the biggest challenge was he also had insecurities and I'm not, there's, we removed the blame from that relationship at this stage of the game, but I utilized the doubt that I have in my inability to believe in myself to actually start my design business. Mm -hmm. I wanted to prove to the world that I was enough. I wanted to prove to everybody that I could do it all on my own. I wanted to make sure that everybody outside knew that my independence was going to be super strong and I could do it all by myself mm -hmm. after the divorce. I wanted to prove I didn't need anybody which on one hand, running from self-doubt was a benefit to me because a lot of people can use it as fuel. But on the other hand, it really prevented me from understanding who I was, understanding why the relationship failed, understanding what it was that I was really running towards versus running away from. And it took me another 12, 13 years of continued abusive relationships mm -hmm. to start to recognize the patterns of what I was doing to finally get into one that I was in the hospital a couple of times, not from a physical abuse, but from accidents that happened. And it just, it got to the point where I realized that I had finally had enough. So in, in your book, The Chameleon Diaries, do you address specific strategies or techniques to help individuals overcome self-doubt and insecurities? Share a few examples if you could. Yep. I certainly will. Number one, I would say learning how to love yourself is one of the most, if not the most important strategy that you can come up with. And that sounds like such a broad and grand statement, but there couldn't be any more truth in it. There is a fear behind learning how to love yourself as well, because it's just something that we haven't been able to do. We are so consumed by what we're supposed to look like when we see things on social media and we watch TV and movies and there's this, you know, this fairy tale concept that we see as we're growing up as children, both in cartoons and television shows and movies everywhere that we forget to fall in love with ourselves. And for me, one of my greatest understandings was recognizing the patterns that I had been on repeat, repeat for 30 or so years. I had a great and wonderful upbringing with loving parents. And I, unfortunately, there was one incident where they, it was a complete and utter mistake, but they left me at the car dealership when they went to go look at a car. I had climbed out of the back seat. They thought I was still there taking a nap. And I ended up on the inside when they said thank you and goodbye to the salesperson. They got back in the car, saw that the blankets were still in the back seat and drove away. And I was four years old <laughs> and it left such an amazing abandonment uh, imprint on me. And fast forward to a couple of years ago, this jackass that I was with, there were some substances involved, if you will. And he thought it would be a good idea to just go off with his friends when we were down in Florida together and not tell me where he was going and not let me know what was going on. And he just left and I come out of the hotel and he's just like my parents were, Gone. driving away in the car. And it was a trigger for me. And so those two specific instances, I couldn't understand why I lost my shit in the parking lot of that mm -hmm. hotel to the point of like I was, the police showed up. I mean, I was out of control and it was embarrassing and it was mm -hmm. horrific. So mm -hmm. I then came back and I 
saw a really amazing therapist and mm. I did some inner child work, which really brought out the start of me understanding what my pa- mm. patterns. But again, like two things, finding out your pattern, mm. going back and doing some research on yourself, right. but also finding a great therapist mm. and a great coach. Therapists have been a real challenge. I mean, as it was hard before the pandemic, but <laughs> now post pandemic, you know, certainly, you know, in my family law practice, people are dying to try to find a therapist. And they're just very few with availability. And the ones that have availability usually are by Zoom. You don't get that person to person FaceTime that I think is so beneficial. So yeah, the value of a good therapist, but at this stage of the game, really any therapist, if anyone can find one, is just is huge. You know, the inner child work, tell me more about that. That sounds... It's so interesting. Oh, it is. I've actually been doing it for years, but as we grow up, we realize it's, there's another way of looking at it. It can be called part therapy. And so there are memories and experiences that are imprinted on us as we grow up. It forms our character. It forms our ability to react or accept or deny certain situations as we grow your family background can really shape your perception on what relationships are supposed to be. For example, if you grow up in a loving and supportive environment with two parents that stay married and you've got a loving brother, and you know, it's like the Brady Bunch or the fairy tale thing, there's a good chance that you're going to come out pretty good on the other end. And on the flip side of that, you could be with a single mother who may have alcoholism or different types of abuse issues that get transferred to you as a young child or a baby before you even have the ability to form memories. Mm -hmm. These habits from our parents are being instilled within us at a young Mm -hmm. age because we're learning right through them. So you're saying that at a young age, children observe and are able to latch on to these experiences like a sponge. Right. Yeah. As children, we absorb what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. We, because our systems just aren't smart enough. And sometimes I wonder, even if we're 150 years old, if we're ever really smart enough to Mm -hmm. fully absorb things. Right. We are chill. Who we are as children, we absorb these things and we hang on to them. And Mm -hmm. as we get older, we never have opportunities to let them go, so to speak. So doing inner child work especially gives us the opportunity to take a step back and to go into those memories. I ended up using them more as forgiveness opportunities for myself. So stepping back into when I was four years old, I held held some sort of anger and frustration and sadness thinking that my parents left me. It was an honest mistake, but I had to go back and in a therapeutic mindset and forgive my parents at that age, because now it's a matter of understanding that it was just a simple mistake and they would never have wanted to have left me there. And inner child work, there's multiples, you know, there is the four-year-old self, my eight-year-old self, the Mm 13-year-old, my 17, and you think of specific instances that happened during your life at those time frames. They stay with you. They stay with you. And there are times where they can be really amazing and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then there are times where they can be horrific and really forming on why you may not be able to feel love moving forward because you maybe were abused earlier on. You lost trust issues. It's no wonder that, you know, adolescents in this day and age struggle so much. You know, it's just, it's incredible. How important is self-awareness in the process of overcoming self-doubt and insecurities? In all honesty, I think it is one of the most important parts. Becoming self-aware and acutely attentive to who we are in all aspects of how we walk around and what it is that we do, it's a major part of our healing journey. Too many people get buried in their work. They get buried in their kids and their own personal hobbies. Buried in their marriages. They get buried in their marriages. They get buried in what everybody else is doing all of the time. Mm -hmm. They completely distract themselves from themselves. They're not aware Mm -hmm. of their emotions. They don't know why they get mad at their spouse for not taking out the trash. They don't know why they're mad at, you know, maybe they have road rage or something like that. And that goes back to learning where your imprinting has come from as a child Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. becoming more self-aware of how you react to other people, how you react in certain situations, what makes your stomach turn over in good ways and in bad ways. 
And what are your reactions or responses to those feelings? It's being aware of our emotion from the core of who we are, which really gives us the opportunity to respond with integrity right. at the core right. of who we are. And right. if we don't like who that core person is, it also gives us the opportunity to go back and adjust it. I think it goes to what you were saying earlier about patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Patterns to just repeat themselves over and over again. And self-awareness is just one of a few tools that you need to do a pattern interrupt. Absolutely. Right? I like to call it a pattern interrupt. Yeah, I think that's a phenomenal you term. Know, just stop it. You know, you got to throw the stick in the spokes at some point. Yeah. And it's not, there's no magic bullet. There isn't, you know, and we're all different. Everybody is 100% different from the next person, unless yeah. you're a twin, and then there's, you know, that connection there. But it is the pattern interrupt, I think, you hit the nail on the head. Right. When we become more self-aware of what we're doing on a daily, mm -hmm. a weekly, a monthly, or even a yearly basis, right. those are our habits. And when we interrupt those habits, there's this really amazing saying that Tony Robbins uses all of the time, and multiple of my coaches have used it before, is... Change your habits, change your life. If you can acknowledge that you have a habit of sleeping in and you're hitting your alarm clock every morning and you're just dragging ass to get to work and uh, well, look at the habits for how do you go to bed? You know, what is your daily routine? How can you actually make an adjustment to improve what you're doing on a day-to-day -day right. basis, which will be very slow, but in the long run, pay itself off. Right. And it's almost <clears throat> like a self-fulfilling prophecy because you know, people are in these toxic relationships you know, these self-sabotaging patterns, right? And then one way or another, you're faced with the loss of the relationship, right? right? Whether it's brought upon you or whether it's by your choice. But that more or less forces the habit change because you can't go on anymore. You get to a point where you just, you're either, you're, it's either so toxic that you're going to kill each other right. or you've reached rock bottom and you can't feel that pain any longer because it's just, you, you finally recognize this is not who you are and it's not who you're supposed to be. In your emotionally abusive relationships, let me ask you, mm -hmm. because there was that sort of ongoing pattern that went on for oh, yeah. years and years. What was your aha moment? Did you have that moment of clarity or was it all over a season yep. of events uh, that sort of unfolded? I had the aha moment in the same relationship at least a half a dozen times before I finally got to the point where I said, I can't, I cannot do this anymore. And so it, honestly, something finally clicked. It wasn't the time when I was with him and I broke my foot flipping off of a scooter. And instead of him taking to me to the hospital that night, I ended up sleeping on the couch and he took me the following morning after his meeting and didn't even help me into the hospital. And then he ghosted me for three weeks. Mm. I let him back in wow. because he came with flowers and I'm sorry. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm sorry. I'll never do that again. I didn't know what to do. And I thought, how can I let this asshole back into my life? But I did. You did. Because there was, I had gotten to a point where I had been broken down by him and by multiple priors so many times to have a low self-worth where I didn't stand up for myself, where I didn't turn around and say, no, this isn't good enough. I can do better. This isn't what I want in my life. I continue to say, I'm going to take what I can. You settled. I settled. And it was... It was it it was abuse. At the end of the day, his habits in our relationship were so abusive, but it was the breaking of the foot. It was the, hey, let's go away to Arizona, and then I don't hear from him two weeks, and I find out he's in Arizona. Mm -hmm. It's the finding somebody else's clothes mm -hmm. in his apartment. It's all of those things, and still going back. Rationalizing it. Rationalizing it. Yeah. Oh, you know, it was just a mistake, and it, it finally got to the point where we had such a volatile trip to on his boat to the Cape and the Islands that when we came back, we were meant to get together two days later. And he called me and he said, I just can't do this anymore. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? 
neither can I. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped talking to him. And it was just one of those, for me, it was very subtle, but it was Mm a shit storm of event Mm -hmm. over the course of two years that accumulated to the point where I just said, that's it. Enjoying the interview with Amanda Greaves? Find out more about her and her book, The Chameleon Diaries, on her Instagram at Amanda underscore Greaves, or click the link in the show notes. So in your mind, with these toxic relationships and the patterns, can you discuss the role of resilience and self-confidence after a divorce or loss of relationship? Rebuild. So, yes, I can. The role of resilience and rebuilding your self-confidence after the loss of relationship, it goes back to a previous question, recognizing your patterns and becoming more self-aware. The one piece of advice, if you take nothing else out of this podcast while you're going through a divorce or you're in the process or it's just finalized is please don't jump on a dating website. If you're looking for a distraction, go distract yourself with a new hobby. Go learn how to paint or, you know, go go ride a bike, go do something. But getting into bed with somebody else, you know, there's this old phrase that says the best way to get over someone is to get under someone. And that really is not because you're not just perpetuating your own pain and you're not dealing with it. You're actually pushing it on to somebody else at the right. same time. And and you don't know what kind of emotional baggage. You don't know where they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. So rebuilding your own self-confidence is becoming more self-aware. Go do the things that you couldn't or didn't or, sh- or quote unquote shouldn't have done while you were with somebody else, while you're in that marriage or that relationship. Right. Go find yourself more. And mm-hmm. building that self-confidence could be the simplicity of for women going and getting your nails done or for men, you know, even just going to the gym and learning, learning how to take better care of your body, learning how to take better care of your mind, figuring out where your emotions are. Find friends that aren't going to assist in wallowing in your sorrow. Mm -hmm. They're actually going to look at you with opportunities of help and support. They're going to offer you advice that matters. That matters. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of it comes back to being present in the moment, right? Yep, very I know much. after, you know, I got sober in 2014 with my recovery, it was so hard to be present, especially with my kids, you know, without the crutch of alcohol to take the edge of life off, you know, to like when I was newly sober, it was like trying to like be there with them and enjoy the moment with them without alcohol was so hard. But again, it comes back to habits and learning new behaviors and just like alcohol was a crush crutch for me you know with so many people and i see it in my family law uh, mm-hmm. people coming out of divorce going into divorce what in you know sometimes you know i have clients who come back to me a year after i initially consult with them two years because they're just in again the pattern right yeah but it's the emotional crutch you know these crutches can look like different things mm-hmm. depending upon who we're talking about for me it was alcohol for someone else you know it's emotions it's that a self-identity caught up in a relationship i need this relationship as harmful and as toxic as it might be to me to define who i am and oh by the way that definition is a lot less than who i really am my true self-worth is what it shakes down to really without any i mean you just took all of the words out of my mouth i think it's awesome and Thank you for sharing the story of your sobriety because one of the one of the books that I had been reading is by oh I forget what her name is but I can certainly tell Beatty I forget Melanie Beatty and it's called The Language of Letting Go and it has been sitting on my coffee table for 2 years now and it's literally a day by day sobriety journal and or a meditation or just like a simple daily note you know of I am enough or this is how you let it go and these mm. types of things. So your re- your reference to sobriety and how other people use different quote unquote numbing techniques. For me, the numbing certainly was the alcohol. There's drugs related mm. in some of it as well, but we find through our habits and through our patterns, emotional homes mm. that we continue to go back to. And one of my girlfriends and I were having a conversation and I can relate this right back to the design world that I live in. And I said, you know, it's time for a renovation. 
I need to renovate my emotional home. I need to make some changes. I need to clear out the cobwebs and make, I need to move some walls around, maybe do an addition out back, maybe knock the second floor off, like legitimately do a renovation to my own personal emotional home. And once I started referencing it in a world that I have been living in for 20 plus years, mm -hmm. AKA the design world, it started to really make more sense to me. I was mm -hmm. able to see how my emotions were affecting each compartmentalized portion of my life. Mm -hmm. And when I went quite honestly, room by room and cleared out the emotional baggage, figured out what was still worth having, understood where the numbing capacities came into play. It takes a long time, but if you dedicate yourself to it, the opportunities to rebuild your self-trust by renovating where your emotions go, where you go when you feel sad, mm -hmm. even when you feel excited, is that the best place for you? Yeah, that really speaks to <clears throat> the negative thought patterns. Mm -hmm. So interrupting and stopping the negative thought patterns is key, you know, and to do that takes practice. A lot of practice. It takes tools and it takes help. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can do one without the other, but if you have the opportunity and the determination to find all three mm -hmm. and to use all three together, it really is the trifecta of your personal journey on self-healing, on self-discovery, because you can't do one without the other. You learn a lot about yourself when you choose to start to heal. So it's interesting. The self-discovery. Let's talk about the timeline. Self-discovery. You can't really rebuild your self-esteem until you go through the self-discovery phase first because you need to know who you are yeah. before you fix what's yeah. wrong, right? Yeah, but let's look at it. I want to change how you worded that because okay. for the longest time, and for the longest time, I was wandering around with this cloud of what's wrong with me over my head. And I was constantly looking at, I need to fix this about myself. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, there might be a few things that aren't necessarily 100%, but there's nothing wrong if you are in the method or if you're in the mode of trying to make some changes in your life. And when we think of ourselves as being, we need to be fixed, are we really mm -hmm. broken? Mm. Or is there just something inside that hasn't had enough attention? Is there something inside that just didn't evolve the way that maybe it could have because it got stopped at the age of 14 or it got stopped at the age of eight based on our history? I've, done, I've been practicing taking the terms, I'm broken, I need to fix myself out of my vocabulary because I don't want to... I want to change my thought patterns, I want mm. to change the negative beliefs that there is something wrong with me mm. and turn around and say, no, Amanda, you are enough, you know, mm. and no, Ellen, you are enough. And mm. to be quite honest, there are times where I am way too much for some people, mm. but that's okay too. I'm the perfect amount for who I am and who I am meant to be mm. at some point in time. And clearly they're not available yet because I haven't met him. He's working on himself too. And at some point in time, somebody's going to come around and be like, wow, you're the perfect amount for me. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that person is actually me before I meet whoever he may be right, down the right. Because when we all get to a point where we believe in and we accept ourselves wholly, again, yeah. self-awareness, self-discovery, learning how to love yourself so much so that you have the ability to go out and be who you are authentically mm -hmm. without any editing, without any hesitation, but you know that you have the ability to say the right things at the right times for the right reasons, right. but also pause and stay quiet and listen instead of speak up. There's, It's more just finessing who you are as a person. Tell me about the role of self-care in your journey and the importance of practicing it. Yeah. yeah. And what's the difference between self-care and getting preoccupied with self. So being self-absorbed mm -hmm. or self-aware. Self-care for me looks like taking a bath. Looks like if I'm feeling overwhelmed with too many things to do, I call 
you know, a dinner date, a friend with a friend, and I say, hey, you know what? I have a lot going on right now. Can we reschedule? Self care is becoming more aware of what your body needs, what your emotional needs are. So, if it's and taking inventory of those habits, totally taking inventory. You know, for me, it's especially coming out of a divorce, right? Like you're, you're like shit, I'm broken and I got to fix myself and all these things. So you see all of these people coming out of these relationships, they start going to the gym, you know, they start going on diets, they lose weight or they do the opposite. You know, some people don't have that mindset. So self-care is really taking care of yourself because it's going and getting a facial, getting a massage, going for a walk, Getting into the woods and taking your shoes off and just grounding yourself in nature is a form of self-care. It's connecting yourself back to the source of where we actually have come from. Physical, mental, and spiritual. All of all, it. Yeah. All of it. Meditation is something that I have been practicing forever and I my practice is terrible, but I know the more I do it, the better I feel. If there are meditation practices that you can get into, even if it's five minutes a day, three days a week, Practice it. You're giving your mind those five minutes of calm. I mean, mm. when I started my business 13 years ago, there was probably three or four years where all of a sudden I would look up and be like, oh, shit, I missed fall. <laughs> <laughs> or, wow, it's summertime. I didn't even see the flowers start blooming. You know, and it's just... That's when I was like in the middle of another relationship that was just happening because I didn't right. have any time to pay attention to it. And that's what happens when you're in a marriage, especially with mm -hmm. children. Shit just happens. And next thing you know, you're five years down the line and you haven't been able to pull your head out of the sandbox to yeah, see what's yeah. going on. In your experience, mm -hmm. how can individuals learn to embrace vulnerability huh? as a means of healing and growing after divorce and trauma? It's a tall, it's a tall order to fill. It's a big Embracing question. vulnerability. It's um, Here I am. I surrender. Yeah. Okay. I'm vulnerable, you know. And, you know, I th you and I are cut from the same cloth, right? It we're sounds that way. Owners, we're <laughs> strong women. Yeah. And, you know, we sort of, you know, but we have a lot of hidden vulnerabilities and insecurities. How can people embrace that vulnerability? Well, first of all, I am no expert on vulnerability, but Brene Brown, she is a an amazing, she has her PhD in research in psychology. She studied shame for X and so amount of years. She has this amazing book called Atlas of the Heart, and it talks about all of these different emotions and vulnerability is one of the primary ones. Learning how to embrace it is probably one of the scariest things to do for anybody. And vulnerability has different connotations for different people. I now look at vulnerability as a strength, as an opportunity, because when I can open myself up to a situation and trust in the process and allow myself to feel, allow myself to experience whatever has to be, you know, thrown at me or given to me or put in front of me, that's where I feel that vulnerability can be used as a powerful So It can be used as a great opportunity to learn more about yourself and learn more about the environment that you're in. Too many, and maybe not too many, that's judgmental, but a lot of people look at vulnerability as a massive weakness. Men are brought up to know most at this day and age, things are changing, I'm sure. Boys don't cry. That's a sign of vulnerability. That's a sign of showing your emotions. Well, newsflash, boys do cry. Men that are in touch with their emotions are actually very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and, I agree. and to be honest, when a man has the ability to talk about his emotions in, a, in an honest sense and be vulnerable and let us in as women or anybody, let friends or family in, you are in a vulnerable capacity allowing us to understand you better. When you are quote unquote vulnerable, you are allowing people to know how to communicate better with you. You are giving people the tools. You are giving people the roadmap, if you will, to mm. how do you tick? How do you think? Oh, well, he's telling me about some situation that happened when he was 15 years old and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's very vulnerable. That's a lot of emotional you know, capacity. I now know what his triggers might be. So it's a learning opportunity, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. And right. for me, 
embracing that vulnerability. You can't, I can't do it all of the time. There are certain times where your boundaries come into play and you just say, oh no, that's not going to happen. But embracing it, in my opinion, it shows courage. It shows that you have patience with yourself Mm -hmm. and the environment that you're putting yourself in. It shows that you do believe in who you are and you also can believe in the people that you're starting to spend your time with. Let's talk about mindset shifts or reframing techniques. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest for individuals who are struggling with self-doubt and insecurities? How do they, how can they use that to overcome? I started understanding mindset shifts when I started working with my coach 12 years ago, but I really started learning more when I started following Tony Robbins and his wife, Sage. She said something at one of the events I was at where she said, instead of walking into a situation and feeling, oh my God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me again? You know, whether it's a shitty conversation or maybe you got laid off again, or maybe you got in another car accident again. She, Sage, gave me the concept of things aren't happening to us. There is a strong energetic power around us, whether you want to believe in God or your, you know, your creator, or even just the Big Bang Theory, however you want to look at it. Something is happening around us energetically where the, where you have the ability to shift. And so looking at things where gosh, why is this happening to me? A very simple shift is a simple word is why is this happening for me? Maybe you're getting in multiple car accidents because something is telling you to slow the fuck down. Maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe you're having that same conversation over and over again because you're missing the point or the other person is missing the point. And eventually somebody's going to say it differently and it's going to click. Right. You know, maybe it's, learning how to shift your mindset as to playing the victim of why is this happening to me and turning around and playing more of the victor and saying, this is how things can happen for me. And where's the message in this? What can I learn from all of it? I mean, I was on an amazing workout role a few months ago. And after an event, I'm jumping on my personal trampoline in my dining room and I freaking kicked it in the middle of the night by mistake and and (laughs) bruised my ribs. So I stopped working out for six weeks and I laid on the floor laughing. My friend was there and I thought, okay, where's the message in this? You know, (laughs) what am I supposed to do now? All I wanted to do was get in better shape. And now they're telling me, Amanda, you have to slow down again. It's hard. It's so hard, you know, and for me, you know, I've always struggled comparing myself to others. Oh, you know, constantly. I mean, we all like, do it. Oh, my my sister, I love her. She's such a wonderful person. She's an amazing mother, amazing wife. She's a politician. She's a business owner. She just, she does it all. And, you know, what? I try not to compare myself, but, you know, my mind, you know, I'm a competitive person. Yeah. You know, that's just how I'm put together. It, yeah. It is so hard not to compare yourself to others. But when you're going through a healing process and a healing journey, it's such a toxic way to think. It is. You know, and even when you make these self resolutions, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be jealous. You know, I'm going to celebrate the other person. I'm going to have a grateful heart. The thoughts come back. I mean, what, how do you address the aspect of comparison and the tendency to measure one's progress against others during the recovery process? How do you do it? Well, you can't. <laughs> we all have a different path. We're all on a different journey. And again, one big word of advice, do everything you can to not compare yourself to others. This is your life. This is your story. You have the ability to change your story. And it's, you know, change your habits, change your life change your story, change your life. If you stop telling yourself the same things over and over and over, I can't do this. This is the worst. How am I ever going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. To I've got this. I'm going to make it better. Here's the plan to get out of it. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a big shift. I mean, I, my book is called the chameleon diaries for a reason. It's because I grew up comparing myself to everything and everyone around me. And in the process of comparing, I tried to fit in with them Mm -hmm. or on the complete opposite end of that, I tried to stand out and make myself better than the people that I was spending my time with. And it was like my relationship success and my business success started out being based on comparing myself to 
you know, my brother's married with a couple of kids and they seem pretty happy or my girlfriend's married and she's got a wonderful company. And I have been in that relationship status of how come everybody else can figure out these relationships, but I can't. And so I'm constantly comparing. And when I stopped comparing what it is that I am in the situations that I am involved in to everybody else's, it felt like everything got a little lighter. Really? It, yep. It's my roller coaster really slowed down and I stopped looking at it so much as highs and super lows. And, you know, I, I started to acknowledge even more so just how far I've come. Mm. And for comparison speaking, 2008, I got divorced. I got laid off twice. I got the swine flu, which, Ugh. you know, you, it, you match it all together. So That's I'm like the perfect storm. It was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. And I was like, what, the, what is going on here? And I took strength from that and started my business. And I continued to compare. Why can't I find another relationship? And I was on a hunt. And it was, I met some really wonderful people in the process. But I was still comparing and that comparison worked to my advantage in my company because I worked harder to try and be better than the person next to me. But then I realized the only person I was challenged against was myself, was my mm -hmm. own self-worth, my own inner beliefs, my own limiting beliefs of I can't do this, I'm not enough to shifting them and saying, mm -hmm. you're so much more than enough, Amanda, you've got to keep going and you're killing it. You're doing right. great. You know, comparison, I think, is probably one of the one of the more so toxic it's it is toxic so, but so i think toxic. it's one of the more dangerous beliefs that we can have and that we can carry through our lives because it will stop us from excelling and it will keep us in a place where we end up playing small and if we stop comparing and we start living authentic and we start living with the belief that we are enough maybe we're too mm -hmm. and that's awesome maybe we're just the right amount learning how to move forward out of that place of comparison and owning who you are mm -hmm. authentically is there's so much strength and there's love and there's self-care and there's awareness it that's where things start to storm in a right. beautiful way you know that's where the rainbows start right. to show up and it's again the chameleon diaries there's one story after the next that reference a lot of these things but in the end i'm now here right having the strength and the courage to stop comparing myself you know, I'll throw this in at the end, but having imposter syndrome of, oh gosh, I can't do that. That's, you know, somebody else is better at that than me. Why am I going to be so much better? Why are they going to buy my book? And my thought is, I have this unique way to connect with people that nobody else does. Oh, yeah. And I will connect with my uniqueness beyond any type of comparison through other people. So what is the one key message or takeaway that you really hope your readers will gain from the Chameleon Diaries that will empower them on their own journey of overcoming self-doubt and insecurities? Learning how to love yourself primarily, and especially in the terms of getting a divorce or ending a relationship, whether it's just something that has dissolved or whether it's toxic. It we're in an environment, we are in a day and an age where we are bombarded with what we think we're supposed to do. We're bombarded with advertisement and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, like just so much outside influence that when we learn how to actually silence a lot of the noise on the exterior and listen to what's going on inside, mm. recognizing our patterns, understanding who we are, understanding where we want to go, the path starts to get a bit easier when we start to love ourselves more. Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you. No, this has been great. <laughs> <laughs> I really have enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us on episode 11 of the Right Family Law Divorce Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, the Right Family Law Divorce Podcast is not legal, financial, or tax advice, nor should it be construed as such. We recommend that you consult a qualified legal or tax professional before making any decisions about any of the topics discussed in our broadcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe. To catch all the latest from the Wright Family Law Group, sign up for our email list and newsletter on our website at rightfamilylawgroup.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.